Good morning, everybody. Honorable Lisa Mazzone, Representative Ngudula, experts and speakers on various topics regarding human rights in China, Tibet, East Turkestan, and uh, Southern Mongolia. On behalf of CTA, or Central Tibet Administration, I would like to extend hearty and warm welcome, given the weather in Geneva. For the past 60 years, Tibetans have been saying that what happened to Tibet can happen to you. What the Chinese Communist Party did to Tibetans, it will do to you and your people. But no one listened to us. Everybody thought what happened to Tibetans, Uyghurs, Mongolians at the hands of the Communist Party of China was sad, but it's not going to happen to them. For so long, countries around the world tried to convince themselves that by engaging with China, it will gradually transform and ultimately become a democratic country or country which will follow and respect the international norms and values and human rights and democracy. However, after 20 years of engagement, it is not China that is transforming. Rather, China is actually transforming everybody else. I just came from Madrid last night. I arrived midnight. And our friends at the Chinese embassy in Madrid were very busy for the last week or so because the organizers at Madrid for a major festival were told that if I, Sikyong, were to participate in the festival, they will withdraw their participation at the festival. And the organizers were bold enough, courageous enough, and said, it's your choice, but we will have a speaker and representative of the Tibetan people at the festival. So the Chinese delegation withdrew from the festival. But then, when the announcement were made, brochures were distributed, Chinese embassy came back and said, if Si Kiong, that's me, were to speak at the forum, then within a few weeks' time, Chinese President Xi Jinping is coming, they might cancel the visit of Xi Jinping and the trade relationship between Spain and China will be at stake. Now, a mayor of a city is under a tremendous pressure. They don't know how to handle it. But because the event was published, people came to listen. I delivered my message, and I flew last night to Geneva. However, not all cities or companies are bold enough. We know the case of Merit Hotel, where a simple quote on Tibet or a sharing a page on Tibet was reprimanded by the Chinese government. The representative of the Merit Hotel had to go to Beijing, seek forgiveness, and deleted the quote. And also Mercedes-Benz, another employee put something on His Solemnness Dalai Lama, a simple quote on compassion and kindness. Chinese government reprimanded the CEO of Mercedes-Benz in Beijing, apologized publicly and in writing, and the quote disappeared. So among three M's, so for Madrid, Merit, and Mercedes-Benz, I think Madrid has come on top. Now, engagement with China and human rights dialogue. Many countries thought by engaging with China through business, there'll be economic growth in China, a middle class will grow, which will assert freedom and democratic rights in the country, and China will transform into a democratic system. But it did not happen. Some advocated for the last 20 years 
or even 30 years, that by rewarding China, Chinese leaders will behave according to international norms. Mo's favored nation was much discussed and debated, ultimately granted to the Chinese government thinking that China will transform into a democratic system or liberal system. It did not happen. Olympics was granted to China with the condition that human rights in China will improve, but it did not happen. Again, on human rights as well, many experts advocated that naming and shaming of China and Chinese leaders will not work. Rather, quiet diplomacy will help save Chinese leaders' face and actually improve the human rights condition in China. And for so many countries fell into this China's bilateral human rights dialogue trap. I have talked to many diplomats who have participated in such dialogue. Now, after 20 years of engagement, what they say is, it's essentially fruitless, because every year you get into this monologue, there's nothing substantive improving at the condition. If you analyze the last 20 years, since the bilateral human rights dialogue started, situation of human rights in China has gone from bad to worse. However, there are some buyer's remorse going on recently. Today, some countries are finally beginning to feel China's sinister design and how they interfere in their internal affairs and trampling upon universal principles of human rights. We know the case of Lu Xiaobao, Nobel Peace Laureate. Nobel Peace Committee of Norway granted him Nobel Peace Prize for which he was, sent, he was sentenced to a long-term imprisonment. But when he was diagnosed with cancer, at very late stage he was released, and some German doctors were willing to treat him in Germany, and many Nobel laureates, including His Holiness Dalai Lama, signed a petition for his release and the medical treatment for him, but the Norwegian government and leaders kept quiet. And after Lu Xiaobo died, there was just one paragraph of condolences from the Norwegian government. Of all the countries, Norway, which has 5 to 10 percent surplus in budget, a more than a trillion do dollar sovereign fund, they don't need any renminbi of China, but still Norway has succumbed to Chinese government pressure. But there is an ongoing debate within Norway. And I've been to Australia a few times. The first time when I went, the debate in the media was whether then Foreign Minister of Australia would, would meet with me or not. Obviously, he did not meet. Second time when I went, I found out that the then Foreign Minister of Australia had left his office and had become the consultant for the Chinese government. A trade minister of Australia who negotiated a controversial deal had to leave his office and has become a highest paid consultant, receiving $880,000 a year. So you can clearly see this kind of influence and impact happening in Australia. But there's a bit of a bias remorse. If you watch the documentary produced by ABC, Australian Broadcasting Corporation, called Four Corners, it clearly demonstrates how the Chinese engagement with Australia is not just economic. It's political, it's academic as well. In Australian University, a professor mentioned Taiwan. A Chinese students who constitute the largest foreign students in Australia complained and the university fired the professor. Now we are talking about academic freedom. So much so that, that the ruling party of Australia has proposed a bill in the parliament restricting foreign influence, meaning Chinese influence in Australia. So this kind of debate is happening, a bit of bias remorse. We all know that the America is going to have midterm election on November 6th, exactly on the day of UPR. And then uh, the American leaders, president, vice president, and uh, national security advisor all are saying 
that the Chinese interference in midterm election is real. And recently, Vice President Mike Pence gave a very strong speech, perhaps the strongest on China ever, not just condemning the human rights conditions in China and freedom of religion in China, but also about Tibetans, the Uyghurs and Mongols and others. And talking about we are in Geneva, we are in Switzerland, I happened to come last year to the Swiss Parliament. We were supposed to enter the Swiss Parliament at 10.30. Uh, As we were walking towards the Parliament, we were told to come at 10.45. And when we actually reached there, we found out the Chinese delegation were in the Swiss Parliament convincing parliamentarians not to meet with me and with our team. And I'm sorry, Lisa. We had 20-some members who have signed off as friends of Tibetan people in the Swiss parliament, only two showed up. So hopefully, there's a bit of bias remorse, as I said, in Australia and US, and debate is going on even in uh, New Zealand. Hopefully in Switzerland, too, that kind of debate will go, and they will revisit how to engage and bring changes in China. Now, irrespective of the bias remorse or world opinion, China is determined to bring a new world order with Communist Party of China on top of the pyramid. It is rigorously promoting its agenda on the international stage. Socialism with Chinese characteristic in new era, that's Xi Jinping's mantra. Socialism with Chinese characteristic means no democracy, one party dictatorship, and essentially no human rights. The new era means China's rising power on the international forum. In the project of the New World Order, one of China's main initiatives is the Belt and Road Initiative. BRI is connecting, uh, is promoting that through road, railway, seaports, China is connecting with the rest of the world to bring peace and prosperity. Believing this argument, around 70 countries have signed on to it. However, Tibetans have a different experience when it comes to one road, because we lost our country because of one road. When the Chinese army first came to Tibet, we were promised that if we can connect that one highway from China to Tibet, it will bring prosperity to Tibetan people, it will bring peace to Tibetan people. We believe that. In fact, our parents and grandparents composed a song saying, Communist Party of China is so generous. If you provide service for them to build that road, you know, they will shower you with silver coins. Actually, Tibetans were paid silver coins to build that road. Once we completed that road, Chinese trucks came, tanks came, guns came, soon we were occupied, and then we realized few of our ruling elite were also co-opted, like it's happening in Australia, New Zealand, and European countries. And like we composed that song, President Communist Party of China, recently I saw in YouTube a song praising Belt and Road Initiative by participants from 70 countries in their traditional dress. Exact song, almost like exact song, the way Tibetans sang 60 years ago. But then, upon further research by a good analyst, it was found out that the Belt and Road Initiative song was actually stolen from a Coca-Cola ad 20 years ago. They removed the word Coca-Cola and they put Belt and Road Initiative. And then many countries are singing that song and believing that Belt and Road Initiative will bring prosperity and peace to the world. If it, if it happens, we wish you all the best. But as far as Tibetan experience is concerned, we lost our country. And after 60 years, we are here in Geneva at this forum trying to make China accountable for its human rights violation. Already. The Communist Party is here at the UN, in Europe, and in fact around the world. Either we change them or they will change you. In four days through the UPR mechanism, UN member states will have an opportunity to assess and do a real review of China's action on human rights. The least the member states of the UPR could do is speak up the truth and make China accountable. 
if the UN Human Rights Council cannot make China accountable on human rights violations, then who will? That is why the upcoming UPR is so important, where China's human rights record should be put forthrightly and discussed frankly. Irrespective of the outcome of the UPR, we want to make sure that we hold China publicly accountable through this forum. That's why we have gathered here with speakers on Mongolia, Xinjiang, Tibet, and Hong Kong, and we have invited reputable academics and human rights specialists on China. I leave it to experts to ask to make recommendations on how to make the United Nations and Chinese government accountable. We must act together because the Communist Party of China is already here in Geneva at the United Nations. Unless we transform China, China will transform us. Thank you very much, Tushi.